Oh man, I love starting off a good podcast with laughs. Uh, just finished up a good little pre-interview here. So help me welcome uh, the man, the myth, Rodney. I'm a, I'm a buster here for some reason. Rodney Flytime Burks. Every time I, I see you on Facebook, we've been friends on Facebook now for a while, Flytime shows up, not just your name, Flytime. What, what in the world is, is that your nickname or something? What is Flytime? Yeah, well, fly time was just like a the training business I started and cl- led into a club. But I was thinking one day, just, you know, when I was little, my coaches were like, hey, we're on the track, it's fly time. So I was like, it is fly time, but it's always fly time. If, you know, you step out, you're feeling good, you got the suit on, it's fly time. You fly today. Or you see that guy on the basketball court, you're like, hey, he was flying down that court. So I was like, if I do fly time, I can branch off with everybody because speed kids. Everybody likes to fly. I, I like that. Not only – speed not only track but speed so basketball football and you kind of did the the dress thing you know the the clothes yeah, i've yeah, seen yeah. some pictures of you on facebook <laughs> you know how to how to get fly as well my man i, I like that I i'm young that. i gotta stand out in the coaching game there's some really high dressed coaches out there <laughs> hey, you, you, you can't mention that without mentioning zoe up in pittsburgh the best dressed man oh, in yeah. track and field forever and ever i love that guy he we is, gotta get him on the cover of them track and field magazine or something man, that, <laughs> we gotta be careful because then they're gonna mandate it and you guys everybody's gonna have to dress up like that you don't we don't want that now it's not we don't want that high. standard to go up too high really that's, right. track standard. <laughs> <laughs> that's it man that's it well rodney thanks for joining us today uh we've been planning this for a while so i'm super excited to uh, get to know you better like i said we've been friends on facebook for a while and we met i think I think we met when you were at Oklahoma State for a while. When I was at Oklahoma State with yeah. Giles, yep. yep. Yeah, exactly. Another shout out to Giles McDonald, man. Another great dude in our industry, man. Love, sure. love that guy to death. So let's get to know you a little bit better. Let's go back in our Wayback Machine here. Talk to us where you grew up. How did you get into track and field? And let's start there. Yeah, so I'm um, originally from Joliet, Illinois, right outside Chicago, about 20 miles from Chicago. Um, I was a baseball guy, basketball guy growing up. Um, high school, I played football all through high school, and of course, and it goes hand in hand with track. But unfortunately, it was a crazy story. It was I was in health class my sophomore year, and um, my health teacher was a track coach, and he was just telling everybody what the kids ran. And I was like, man, I ran that in eighth grade gym class. Like, I could do that. And so I said it for months. Man, I could do that. I can run that. It was a 400 too at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so finally, he was like, you know what, Burks, we'll put your money where your mouth is. That day for health class, we took the kids, we took the whole class to the track. And I oh, just took man. my shoes off, just like I did in the neighborhood, and ran that 400, came back, feet was bloody and blistered. I never met, I never ran the time, and so I lost the bet. And so coach was like, welcome to the track team, buddy. So no more baseball. <laughs> and I started running track because I lost, lost the bet that I can run. I think I said I can run a 400 in like, like 49 seconds or something like that. Oh, no. And oh, I just set myself man. up for failure. <laughs> But it was a blessing in disguise, so. Yeah, I'm here, right. I'm here now. That's awesome. So you started running track. Did you immediately fall in love with it? Or, you know, coming from baseball, you didn't, yeah, you were always playing baseball during track season. Yeah, I was always playing baseball and football. And, and I was a sophomore, that sophomore year, I ended up making a varsity team. And I was getting third and fourth. And I was like, okay, I'm getting my butt kicked a little bit. But I'm a sophomore. That was my excuse. I'm a sophomore. So I was like, when I junior, senior come around, I could be right here with these guys. By the time I'm senior, I could be smoking them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just kind of slowly shifted over to track, and I started liking the ribbon that you get to take home every day and the medals and things like that. And um, just been there ever since. I miss baseball. I definitely miss baseball. But high school, it was a lot of just sitting there and you're just waiting. I played center field, so I'm just waiting, killing bugs on the bottom of my hat and things like that, you know. But – it was born. I, I like stealing bases. So I like the speed part of it. I played baseball my fifth grade year and they I was played the position left out. That was my position. <laughs> I, was, I was always left out. Yeah, yeah. That uh, guy never, over there. Yeah, yeah. Never played again, man. I was I was absolutely terrible. Uh you, you mentioned sophomore year, you're getting third and fourth and different things. Uh, but your your excuse was, you know, I'm a sophomore. Like I'm not a junior or a senior yet. Yeah. Did you start getting first place as, as a senior? How did that work out? Yeah, actually, um, my junior year is crazy. I started long jumping, and um, I was, like, like third going in the state as a junior year, my first year ever long jumping. So I, I kind of found my calling in the long jump yeah. for a while. Um, but I here, was, in, here in Illinois? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a heck of a state for track, man. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and it was back then when it was um, two classes, 1A mm-hmm. and 2A. You know, it was with that 
me, Leslie Majors, Blair Headnot, that crew back then. Yeah. Oh, um, four. Wow, is that right? That's interesting. Long you know, time ago. It's funny. I'm glad it worked out for you that you know your sophomore year. Your excuse was. Well, I'm not a senior yet. I'll, I'll be faster and bigger and better. Uh, little known secret. And I, I hope my best friend listens. To it. He's like my brother. Uh, grew up in Alabama. And our freshman year, you know, we, we didn't play football the, the fall semester of freshman year. Um, and all the seniors, you know, we'd sit by them in the cafeteria. They'd walk by. They were huge. I mean, they all felt like, you know, for a freshman, they felt like they were all 6'2", 220. And so me and my brother, we made a pact. We said, We'll wait until our senior year to play football because then we will be bigger than everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, luckily, we did not wait. We started playing in spring of our freshman year and then all through the rest of the three years. But somewhere in our senior year, we remembered that statement of how, you know, we'll wait till senior. It's like, what happened? We didn't get bit. We were still 170 pounds soaking wet, five foot 10. I don't know what, I don't know what the other dudes were. They were huge. We never got there, man. So I'm glad it worked out for you, man. Yeah, yeah, it just don't work out. I didn't ever get six two. Still, I'm still, you know, five eleven. But hey, you're fast. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you're four eleven, seven eleven. If you're fast, yeah. that's, that's all I said. They got to catch me to hit me. So that's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> it. So, uh, and I love it that you were in Illinois during the two class system, man. I, and I know three classes is what we have now. And there's some again, Illinois is just an amazing state for high school track and field. I just love, I used to coach high school in Chicago. That's how I started my career, and. Love the big school, small school, get after it attitude. I just, I just love that. You know, in Alabama, we have six classes. Yeah. There's more people in Chicago than the whole state of Alabama, and we got six classes of track. Is it really? Field. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not as. It's just you know, Texas quality. was like that too. I didn't know. I didn't know that growing up in Illinois. I thought mm-hmm. everybody was like mm-hmm. that. And then, you know, when I went out to college and seeing that there was four classes, five. I was like, well, shoot, I could have been a state champion in your state. I didn't know that. A little different in Texas, though. You know, there's only like, you know, a billion people there. So each class gets But they got the big school, small school working up, too. So Good point, good point. What school, what high school did you go to in Joliet? There's some pretty famous high schools there. Yeah, so I was at Joliet my first year. Um, Hmm. Then I transferred to Lockport. Oh yeah, Lockport. They they had a great 800 meter runner uh, back when I was coaching in the 001s, uh, 99s, uh, 2000s. Um, that you know going to U of I, uh, can't remember his name. God, he was a stud. Though, like 150 kid out of high school. Really? Uh, there, yeah, Lockport. Yeah. Uh, and who's the most famous person to come out of Joliet in any sport? Ooh. Come on, man. I don't know. I'm missing it. Who would you say? Rudy. True. I can't. And you know what's crazy? It's, 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 you got me on that one, too. So when my mom was at Providence for a little bit, he was one of her students. So I used to always ask her questions about it. Well, he was Is one of her right? Right? Sorry, classmates. That's cool. But yeah, yeah, yeah he's most famous. I, I remember a, you know, Rudy powerlifting competitions when we were growing yeah. up. <laughs> they made a movie out of the man. Come on. You're right. You're Come, right. On. Come on. Is. I didn't say the best athlete. I said the most famous. He is. You're right. Because there's some amazing athletes out of Joliet, man. That place for is... Sure. Phenomenal. So you uh, end up being a pretty good long jumper, kind of found your niche as it relates to track and field. Uh, where'd you go to college and why did you choose that school? So I kind of bounced around. Uh, like I said, I was late to, late to track and field. I didn't know much about track and field. Um, not saying I was gonna go to college for baseball. I honestly thought it was gonna be football at the time. Um, you know, our high school went to state two years. We won state two years in a row in football. So all the talk was football, 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 football was the focus. Track, I just so happened to be, you know, good at it. So I didn't know anything about it. And one day, um, my long jump coach who was fresh from, from uh, college. He graduated from Southern Illinois, Edwardsville, actually, Ryan Gold. He was just like, hey, you should go to college and jump. And I was like, well, I mean, how do I do that? I didn't know they had track in college. What do you, what do you mean? Like, really? I, didn't, wow. I, didn't, I knew nothing about it. Um, yeah. And so he was like, you should go to Ren Lake. You should get your, uh, you know, learn track and field. See yeah. what it's like. Get your, get your feet grounded a little bit. So I went there um, and I got to Ren Lake and we didn't have any long jump pits. And so I was fast. I went to state in the relays. And so I was like, well, I can run. And they were like, no, you're a jumper. And I was, so we were literally long jumping in the uh, golf sand trap. That's where our long jump practice was. <laughs> So I was like, I mean, uh, I don't know about this a little bit. <laughs> I got to transfer. Wow. And so I transferred to Florissant Valley. And when I transferred to Florissant Valley, I feel like that's when my track and field career really took off. Yeah. Ren Lake showed me 
what track was really about. I mean, I had four or five guys that transferred in from Barton. I had roommates from the Bahamas and Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, this track thing is way bigger than just Illinois. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, now I'm in here and I got to swim. I'm in the, I'm in the ocean. I got to swim. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's time now. And that's when I was like, I want more for this. And so that's when I went to Flow Valley. And there, same thing. I got good jump training at the time. They had a few 24-foot jumpers with Leon, uh, with Leon, Leon Watts and, uh, oh, my God, it was a few of them. They went on to Oregon and transferred out mm -hmm. and had great success in the jumps there. And Who was your, who was your coach there at Flow Valley? Oh, I had James Gillespie. And then <laughs> Coach uh, Stevenson used to come around. Rest in peace, Coach Stevenson. He used to come around and help out all the time. So when Coach Stevenson was there, you know, we started, like, sneaking around. Hey, Coach Stevenson here. And hey, y'all button up. <laughs> you know, Steven, <laughs> Coach James was cool. But, like, we used to play basketball with Coach James, too, at the same time. We played open gym. So we respected him. But when Coach Stevenson came around, it was like, hey. <laughs> James, and I don't know Coach Stevenson all that well. I've heard – but the lore is there. Like, I – yeah, I would have been buttoned up around Coach Stevenson. Um, I've known James for quite a while. In fact, we used to uh, he used to host a lot of level ones at, at Flow Valley, and I, he used to bring me down to teach. And I tell you, James is one of those hidden gems of our sport. Does so much for our sport. Uh, they unfortunately dropped the program there, but man, I tell you what, that dude fought so hard for that program. Does so much for the sport of track and field. I I love that guy. Like I said, he's an unsung hero in our sport. That's definitely the best way to describe him. He is a hidden gem. I, I tell him all the time, you know how many athletes that you didn't have on your resume that people really don't know about and you right. just stuck over there in a little high school? And you got Olympians that you didn't coach over there and nobody knows about it. No one knows. And, so. and a good dude. I mean, just yeah. like role model as a father, husband, coach, leader, just a, just a great guy. Oh, Absolutely. God. Absolutely. I was very fortunate to uh, learn from him. Yeah. So where did you go after Flow Valley? So after Flow Valley, um, we went to I went to Oklahoma City University. Mm -hmm. um, stayed there, finished up, had a good success there. You know, we did the NAIA thing, went to Nationals. We had top time in the country. We actually um, broke the NAIA record a little bit when we were at St. Gregory's that oh, since, wow. since before. It was the same coach from St. Gregory. When they shut that program down, they went to Oklahoma City. Okay. So the same coach. Um, so it was it was a great it was a great place, a great program, great tradition. Um, but again, I didn't, I couldn't jump there. So I stayed, but he's like, you can't be as fast as you can in 400 and long jump at the same time. So I'm like, all right, coach, whatever you say, I'll do it. And so I just gave it the long jump. Um, and then from there, I just started just staying in coaching. I fell in love with track. I just wanted to be around track and field. Yeah. When did that happen? When did, uh, obviously you love track and field because I mean, every institution you went to was I won't say it's for track because the education was there and you got a degree and that's the most important part of it. Um, but, but you kept sticking with track. When did the thought of being a coach start entering your mind? Uh, Oklahoma City. I was in Oklahoma City and I'm not gonna lie. I was a good conversation here. I was I was I was an athlete where I was like, well, coach, why are we doing that? We don't need to do this. What's the point of that? How are we gonna do this? Okay. Well, when I was in JUCO, we did this. We can won nationals doing this. I was that I was that athlete, like okay. the one that everybody hate. But whenever I did it, I gave you my all every time. I just wanted to know why we were doing it, and I just kept thinking about that and thinking about that. And one day, coach was just like, "I don't think that you are trying to undermine me or anything like that. I think you just really want to know why you're doing it before you do it." And I was like, "That's it." And he's like, "You should be a coach." And so that summer, so this was Coach Houston when I was at Oklahoma City. What were you studying for your degree? Oh, uh, biomechanics and exercise physiology. I was thinking about going to be a physical therapist, actually. Okay. But then they was like, you got to go to PT school, and then you got to get your doctor's degree. And I was like, let me go get this bachelor's over here in kinesiology, and then I'm out of here. <laughs> so that's how that went. But that was a quick change. <laughs> but I got I to go more school? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm good. I think I did like 20 hours. <laughs> it's like, hey, let me find this application. I got 20 hours completed. Yeah. You know? Backspace, backspace, backspace. <laughs> no, I was good on that. But, um, but, but no, yeah, he was just like, you should be a coach. And actually that summer, I went back and started helping Coach Boatwright in the Royal Flyers. And so I started helping out throughout the summer, giving back. Just you worked with Coach Boatwright? Yes, I was a, I was a flyer. Oh, 
What a great guy. What a history and sport he has, his daughter and family. Oh, God, no, way man. back. We talked on the phone yesterday for about two and a half hours. Yeah, <laughs> he'll call me up like once every year or two. And he's always like, uh, he starts to introduce himself. And I'm like, uh, yeah, coach, I got gotcha. you. I know yeah, who yeah, you yeah. are. We You're know good. who you are, right. So, so now you can put the pieces to the puzzle together. That's where fly time came. When we were always on the track, he was fly time, fly time, fly time. So I wanted to pay homage to him I love that. for helping me when I was a junior or senior in high cool. school. And I didn't want to just come to Oklahoma and just do Oklahoma Flyers. Right. So I just said, we can do fly time. That's cool. And now you can connect the That's pieces cool. to the puzzle. Yep, I'm Coach right. Boatwright. So how, what, how did coaching look once you got your degree there at Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma Christian? Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. City. Oklahoma City. City. Yep. Uh, how, did, how did it become into coaching then? What was the first um, step? First thing I did was call my coach and apologize for all the back talking that I did. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> That's a true story, I promise you. I called Coach, G J coach James, and I was like, James, I just want to apologize for everything that we put you through. Because <laughs> now that I'm up here in the collegiate coaching field, I see what it's like, and I don't know how you dealt with us. I really don't. Because we were a team full of crazy kids. But that was I great self-awareness. <laughs> I appreciate you, Coach James. I really do. He just kind of laughed and was like, yeah, you thought it was all easy, huh? <laughs> but uh but no i mean that's that's kind of was the first that was the first thing right mm -hmm. there that i know mm -hmm. it's like whoa this is different you gotta you gotta deal with personalities mm -hmm. versus the x and o's mm -hmm. you can know mm -hmm. all the x and o's but if you can't manage personalities it's not gonna get you nowhere that's, that's how it. i that's yeah. how i feel. so what was the first coaching job what school were you at and how did it go uh so actually the first coaching job was Northwest Classing. It was a small little inner city school in Oklahoma. And I stayed there for one year. Um, I got one kid in the state. And then from there, I went on to College of DuPage, actually. And so I was coaching there and had great success there. Um, that was the year that they went from Division Three JUCO up to Division One JUCO yeah. that first year. And so I was like, hey, it's perfect. I'm coming from JUCO. I know what this is like. It's, right. some, it's some dogs on this level that you mm -hmm. have to come with it. And we broke the school record, had great success and, and things like that. And it was oh. just like, whoa, okay, I'm in there now. This mm -hmm. is collegiate coaching. And from there, um, that's what led me back to Oklahoma, to Evan Memorial High School. And that's what I would really say that my coaching really, really, that's when I learned the art of coaching. When you went back to coaching high school, yep. when you felt like you finally started learning the art of coaching, I kind of the, the, the next coach. level, not just get on the track, tell a kid to run, yep. the actual ins and outs of coaching. That's interesting. What, what yep. about what about high school coaching uh, helped you come to that conclusion? Well, um, Coach Grantham, um, he's, an, he's, an, he's another James Gillespie. He's a, like a second father. He taught me so much. When he taught me how to deal with parents. He taught me how to see what can happen from the decision, the consequences before you tell the athlete mm -hmm. what you want them to do or your expectations. And so a lot of times I knew how to counteract that by knowing the answer before I asked it. And so now you know different ways to approach the athlete. And so mm -hmm. he taught me how to deal with certain situations like that. He, we used to argue all the time. <clears throat> he, used, he was very simple. He was like, hey, you know what? Just get the stick around, run fast, you lace your shoes up, you win a championship. And I was like, yeah, coach, but you got to stay to this side of the lane. We got to count this steps off. We got to go right, left, right. We got No, co coach, figure out how to get it done, get it done. And I was hmm. like, okay, all right. So then I learned it's more than one way to just do this thing. Hmm. So then I started learning the art, you know, how to scope what you're trying to create. And that's what it was. And still to this day, I mean, I talk to him whenever I need advice. I appreciate him uh, for everything that he taught me. But that's that's what it was. I just learned how to build the sculpture. And you spent six seasons there. Six seasons. And so, how did that go? It was it's one thing to learn the art, but did you actually win? Did you? Oh yeah, produce? yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, we took over Oklahoma. <laughs> we came in and, and wrecked shop. Um, we went what four state championships in a row. Holy um, cow! Yeah, we had this little rich suburban Edmond school over there and just kind of like took all it like, well, when those suburban kids get that fast, right? It was like, hey, 
don't worry about it. Just just get over here and run. <laughs> but it was fun. And it got to the point where, and I liked him. He had that fire and that passion in him like me. And we complimented each mm-hmm. other. And he was like, you know what? I'm tired of winning state in Oklahoma. Let's go to Texas Relay. Let's go to Kansas Relays. Let's see if we can get into the uh, Air Force Academy high school and meet and things like that. And so we started branching out and starting to expand. And we wanted – which in turn led that to opportunities for the kids. And I remember that conversation. Mm-hmm. He said, I want to host a meet at OU. I want to host a high school meet at OU. And I want to get surrounding teams there and state champions. Because when somebody look up that state champion on the internet and they see our kid in second or third place, that's the opportunity for that kid to go to college. Oh, and so wow. we started to branch out and think if we go to Texas Relays and do that. When they look at the results from Texas Relays, they see that small little Oklahoma kid who – nobody thinks of or where people think track's not that big in Oklahoma, but there's some, there's some gyms in Oklahoma as well. that People just don't know that they're from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's kind of how that just branched off. And we, we won before I left, I think four, three, four or five state championships. Um, We had over 60 all state athletes, over 30 some individual state champions, um, we went to Kansas Relays and broke the four by one record down there. Never did good at Texas. Every time we go to Texas Relays, we get smoked. Like you have to run the Oklahoma State record to make the Texas Relays final. It's so great. Every crazy. athlete and coach from Texas right now just went, mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like small school, big school, little all the way. I'm just gonna it's the truth. Texas got track and field. I got to give them that. No joke, man. No <laughs> joke. I, I love that you guys won four state titles in a row. Um, it's, it's always special when you win a, a state championship or a national championship as a team, even as individuals, of course, but as you win in a team, that's hard. I mean, things got to go, even the favorites, things still got to go your way. Uh, I remember talking with Robert Johnson of University of Oregon when they won the indoor championship at Texas A&M by something like 30 points, 40 points, like they just demolished everybody, right? And I remember talking to him and I was like, I know everybody's going to say this was really easy because you won by so many. He goes, you have no idea. He goes, it was still clawing, getting lucky. And things just fell everywhere in, in their place and their kids stepped up. But so to win it once it is special. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. To win it four times in a row, that's a whole different level. That consistency, that buy-in, kids are graduating, so new kids are coming in. So what was the secret sauce for four years in a row? It was the culture. The culture. Mm. We used to have colleges come look at the athletes at practice. And I remember it was uh, Coach Sheffield from North Texas K, and mm-hmm. he was recruiting a couple of athletes. And we were talking, and this is the time, you know, I'm still trying to rub elbows and get into the collegiate field. So I'm just, you know, talking to him and learning as much as I can. And, and he's like, hey, Coach, don't, don't worry about me. You can go coach athletes. I can watch them here. I was like, Coach, they got it. And he said, Coach, I don't want to interrupt you, but mm-hmm. I'm looking at your athletes. Nobody came and asked you a question. Nobody's late. Nobody's lost. Look at this. And, and, and I've, I was fortunate enough to walk in that transitioning year mm-hmm. to see that. But what it was was that culture. They knew that I did not have to tell them to work hard. A senior mm-hmm. or a junior would come tell you, hey, listen, you are part of my team. And if you're going to be here, you're going to work. Because if you're on that relay, if your number is called and you're not ready, that hurts us. And I'd be damned if I let that – like, they would literally go over there and tell them that. And I remember they used to come to the boss and somebody used to complain, well, Mia came in and yelled at me for um, not doing the A-skips right. Well, well, did you do the A-skips right? No. Okay, is she, is she helping you? Yes. Is she a state champ? Yes. Okay, well, I think you need to listen to Mia then. Mm. Okay. <laughs> you know, then they kind of, like, walked out. But – that culture was understood. They knew they need to get there. Soon the bell ring, get there, work out. Like they will come to my class. Literally, I promise you, kids would come to my class before school started to get my keys to open the track, and they will warm up and work out before school started. Then we getting closer to state. They will come and skip, bring their lunch to the track to do four by one handoffs for lunch, and then have practice mm-hmm. afternoon. That's how dedicated those kids were, and it's crazy to see them now. And I'm. I'm I'm 34, I feel old. Now they got kids and things like that, and they graduated and stuff, but they still have that discipline in them 
that having them thrive in their everyday careers that, that I appreciate and I really miss. I love them for that. What I hear you describing is, is ownership and leadership. And so what I hear is that the team and specifically your juniors and seniors and the leaders, they actually owned the team. They, they didn't need you to, to get onto a kid for a skips. They got it. It was their team that they, they owned it. So they were going to correct the, the faults. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. Wow. It was special. It was special. Yeah, it, really but, was. it was. It was rare. It was rare to see that. I was gonna say we we talk about that a lot with coaches and even in the private sector as business leaders, uh, it, 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 we talk about it. We want it. We desire it because it is it is special and it does create amazing wins and uh, camaraderie and culture. But boy, it is rare. Man, wow. Yeah. So while all of this was going on, you're winning championships, you're learning culture, you're rubbing elbows with good guys like Carl Sheffield, one of the nicest guys in the whole world and a, and a heck of a coach too, don't forget that. Yeah. Um, you, you, there's still something in you that's kind of desiring to coach at the collegiate level though. Absolutely, always, always. Always. I realized I wanted to be a coach that, that I would say 2006, 2007, um, I wanted to be a Division One coach. I wanted mm -hmm. the challenge. And then I wanted to, again, I'm very competitive. I'm very, I have a big heart, but I'm competitive as well. And sometimes those get mixed up. Mm -hmm. But if you just see my competitiveness is, is I got a good heart behind all the competitiveness. <laughs> just look past that right now for a second. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I remember I said, I want to coach a team that runs faster than the coach had at Oklahoma City University. That was my goal. I wanted a team that run faster than them. And I didn't care if it was high school. I didn't care if it was Division One. I. I didn't care if it was JUCO. I didn't care where it was at. I just wanted a team that can do that. And so I started pushing towards collegiate coaching to the Division One to the NCAA level um, to see if I could do that. And to see if I could be that high school coach who can win championships on Division One level, because there's a, I feel like there's a stigma out there that high school coaches are, let's say, not as good coaches as some collegiate coaches. Some people feel that way, and I mean, I understand, but there's some really good high school coaches out there, and I wanted to prove to people that I could do that, and I wanted to prove to, I wanted to beat my college coach. I mean, that's all. <laughs> uh, I hear that, and, and you're right. It, it is this. Um stereotype I guess that oh if you're in high school you don't know as much as a college coach and and it, and it ripples through college too right if you're d3 you're not as good as a d2 coach and if you're d2 you're not as good as a d1 and if you're d1 if you're not in the power five you're not as good you know it's it's this really strange um, stereotype that happens I, I always tell people you know if you don't think there's great coaches in all levels I always like to look at the d3 national championship results because most of those kids are not um, Division One recruited out of high school and such. You know, they're usually uh, lower developed, lesser developed kids. And go look at the go look at what it takes to win the men's hundred, the women's four hundred, the pole vault. I mean, it is it's freaking good, man. And let me tell you what: those kids aren't running that fast, jumping that far just because they went to college. They're getting coached. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you. I just thought about this. Um, and hopefully you and I are close enough. I can, you, you can trust me enough that I'm asking this question out of genuine curiosity. There's no malice behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was your desire to, to coach division one, was there anything as you're looking now that you're 34 and you can, you got the, uh, you got experience on your side now, right? So you can kind of take a look back now. Was your desire to coach division one at all based on that you did not, for whatever reason, compete as an athlete division one oh yeah oh yeah i was a juco guy so we always had chips on our shoulders you know we stepped up to the track meet we used to always be like you know they got these fancy weight rooms and training tables and stuff like that but we're gonna beat you anyway you know with our one pair of spikes that we bought ourselves and our one warm-up that's made out of cotton no dry fit we're gonna still beat you anyway and so um i i, I kind of wanted to i had a little you know sweet taste in my mouth a little bit to get the the sexy and aesthetics of division one, of course, of yeah. course. But cool. as a division one coach, I look back and it's look at it, coaching is coaching. Whether you're mm -hmm. in high school, division one, division two, three, whatever, a 10 one or a 10 two or the 10 two or 10 one, no matter where level you are at, period. Absolutely.
Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, that, that honesty. That's, it just kind of came to me as, a, as you were describing that. Well, let's go. So six seasons, six successful seasons at high school. Where do you go from there? So um, from there, I started training uh, John Teeters. I uh, started helping with John Teeters. Diego gave me a call because Diego used to be the coach at Oklahoma State. So mm -hmm. we got a good relationship there. I've been knowing Diego for many years, a great mentor of mine. Um, and John had just signed a contract with Under Armour and was supposed to go. But Diego took the job in Miami at the time. And so John was just like, you know, coach, it's expensive to live in Florida. I'm a country boy. You know, I like to stay here in Oklahoma with my Chevy S10 and just just train and just 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 keep it moving, you know. And uh, and so me and John had a great relationship, and he just was like, "Hey, could you coach me?" Come and I talked to Diego, and Diego was like, "Hey, I was, I could send you workouts. Let's stay in communication. Report to me. Let me know how he looks. Let me know if we should add this, if we should take this away." Um, and then that's when I was like, "Whoa." Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This this is some real next yeah, level dude. Yeah. stuff right here. You know, I the first day I remember practice, uh, Diego was like, hey, I want you to live in John to like 64 ground contacts today. And I was like, what? <laughs> Hold on. So you counting how many times his legs hit the feet, hit the ground? Like you actually <laughs> track that and practice? Okay. I, I, all right. 64, Diego. I got you. <laughs> you know, so that's when I started to really learn elite speed training. Mm -hmm. That was, that was great. That was mm. great. From there, that led me to uh, Marcus Maxey. He ended up, uh, he ran at Clemson with the ACC champion at Clemson on the boogie. Actually, mm -hmm. he was in that, that, that whole realm. And uh, he was training, trying to go, um, Pro, he had signed like a apparel contract with Nike, and he was running through the uh, Army. They got that W cap the, program, the w cap, World Cap, mm -hmm. World Cap program through Nike, and so we started focusing on hurdles. So now I'm like, man, I got two, I got two though, you know, really good athletes here. But I was still in the fire, and it and it wow. it it sharpened me, and I sharpened them. You know, we had great relationships. We got plenty of stories, had good times and success. And I honestly feel like that's what set me up to be able to deal with the athletes at Oklahoma State. Hmm. Because now I'm in the Big 12, and now I'm in these big Division One athletes. And though now it's like, okay, yeah, you are. But I did have two, you know, elite athletes over hmm. here. Now I'm a little more more controlled and calm coming in and, and ready to um, step in this deep water. Felt like a little bit, a little bit less like you had to prove yourself and more like, okay, I just get to, to do my system now. I got it now. Yeah, I got it now. Mm -hmm. I got it. Diego helped me with so much, you know, um, Marcus is a technician with the hurdles. So I'm learning from him. He's learning from me. And I told him the first day, I said, I'm not that technician at the time. I'm not the technician in the hurdles that you, I'm not boogie, <laughs> you know, like I, I, it's not that many coaches in the country. I'm about who is, yeah. <laughs> who is, you know, but I can make you faster. Mm. And if we can work together, let's make this happen. And he was like, coach, whatever you tell me to do, I, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. And we were getting up, training five, six in the morning, you know, going to Texas. We, I, I got the Texas relays and finally won Texas relays. Me and Marcus, Marcus won Texas <laughs> relay. So I got one, I got one win. <laughs> Appreciate you, Marcus, for that one. I got, it took me like eight years, but I got one. <laughs> Is he originally from Texas? No, he's actually from Athens, Georgia. Oh, okay, because Texas would take – they would claim him. If, if he's originally from Texas, like, it don't matter. He's still Texan. That's why yeah, he's, he's still a Texan. They're going to claim him. You use the Texas to win Texas. Right? <laughs> no. <clears throat> but, no, yeah, so that's what – you know, I was ready for Oklahoma State because of that. I felt like um, hurdles, I got them now. They became my new passion. Hurdles started to become my favorite event. Like, as a coach now, hurdles is my favorite event to coach. And you never did hurdles. Never did. I did it one time when I was talking smack to a teammate one time. Like, Coach, let me do the 400 hurdles. So I, like, jog, sped up, and jump. <laughs> I'm starting to notice a theme, Rodney. I, it's the competitiveness in me. It, it starts with, I was talking smack. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. That's how I started with track, talking smack. <laughs> now there, if you're friends with Rodney on Facebook, you know there's a lot of Facebook posts like that. Some of them lately have been around – uh, let me tell you about fishing. Let me tell you how to do some fishing. Uh, and I'm mad at you, by the way, because we're supposed to go fishing and, and we're going to get to this, but you're leaving my area. And so I don't know, one day, you know, we're still young enough. One day we're going to get together and we got to go out fishing. Go fish. Um, 
So how did uh, that experience at Oklahoma State, how long were you there? It seems like it was pretty instrumental with who you are today. Yeah, so I was um, officially there for a year, you know, um, while I was a high school coach. I was grinding. I was going to OU. Hey, Coach Harrison, when Van Hootigan and Coach Tyler was there, hey, Mm -hmm. can I sit and be a fly on the wall? Can I just sit and just learn? I was putting my phone on record and just sitting there and coming home on the drive back, just playing it back. So I was always at OU or Oklahoma State learning. Mm -hmm. Um, So officially, I did one year as a volunteer at Oklahoma State. Um, And that was another huge blessing. You know, uh, Giles didn't treat me like a volunteer. He gave me a group. He was like, and it wasn't even just a group. Like, you got the 400 group. You got, it was... That honey girl, I want you to see how you can work with her. Me and her haven't reached the level that we need to to get her true potential. Let's see if it works with you or me and this guy. How about you try it with that guy? And so I was very appreciative to that because I seen how Coach Giles was very – oh, he wasn't that coach. He'd be like, you know what? It ain't working with me, so you off my team or you going to figure it out. No, he was like, well, let's see if it work over here. Let's see if it works. What do you need for me to make you successful? And that's what Giles did to the athletes. And that's what Giles did to me as well. And that's why it was very instrumental at Oklahoma State. We had the four by four that, that uh, qualified for the NCAA Western um, preliminaries, things like that. We had a four by one that was rolling. We were wow, so close to getting it in that four by one. So it, it was great. It was great. I got to travel. Um, you know, being a college coach now, I see that volunteers just don't get to travel at track meets like that or GAs. And I was safe to say, they took me, Oklahoma State took me to every track meet. Um, every track meet that I can go, I was there. And I capitalized on every opportunity. What do you need? You need me to video? You need me to time? You need me to warm them up? You need me to stretch that person? You need me to get water? Whatever you need me to do, I'll do. I love that example of humility from Giles. Um, you're right. I, I could hear that same story a hundred times over and 99 times it'll end with, well, if I can't coach her, then you're not on the team or you got to adapt to my style. Uh, and so for Giles to have humility and say, Hey man, all right, I got this guy and he knows how to coach. Let me try that. Maybe that'll make him or her successful under this other coach. So I love that lesson of humility, man. God bless. Explode that. Yeah. Explode that. And our whole sport will lift up 10 times, man. That's that's Absolutely. Really- uh, so what was after Oklahoma State? So Oklahoma State, then uh, one year there, led me to Illinois State. And, you know, that was great because my home is an hour and a half away. As I say, it's homeless, yeah. All right. uh, I never been to Bloomington in normal. And then I never came to the southern part of Illinois. Never. And then I went to Carbondale. My grandmother was in Carbondale. So I went to Carbondale. Um, but that was it. And so it was able for me to come home. Oklahoma was 13 hours away from Joliet. And so I was able to come home and I was here. Now I got my hurdles. I got the hundred. I don't have jumps. And that was different, you know, being able to coach everything. Now only, now only coach men's and women's sprints, hurdles, and relays. Mm -hmm. So that was an adjustment. Um, But I was home and now I'm finally a division one coach. Mm -hmm. Finally a coach. So I felt like all those years and hard work that I put in, I'm, I'm here. You know, when we set goals like that of, you know, I want to be a Division One coach, and, and I share a similar story. My whole career was about getting to the SEC. I grew up in Alabama. The SEC was the conference, still is. Uh, <laughs> I, I know everybody hates me now, but I'm sorry. I, I am an SEC homer. Sorry. Right after we talk about the Big 12, you throw that in there. Hey, Big 12 is awesome. SEC. All right, come on, man. <laughs> That's what I grew up on. Uh How do you, when you hit such a big goal, you know, make it to the SEC for you, I want to be a division one coach. How do you keep the motivation? How do you keep the foot on the gas that you did? You haven't just arrived. You're there, but you got to, you got to accomplish stuff. How did you keep yourself motivated to keep working and helping those kids get better? So I got a quote that stuck with me. Um, I was going to football state championship my junior year. And they told me the very game, my coach said, strive for the top because the bottom's too crowded. And that, that quote has stuck with me ever since. I use that quote on papers to give me, you know, give me some A's. I use it for mm-hmm. job interviews. And I use it in my everyday life as a coach. And it's the truth. I have not made it. I haven't made it. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't sit and I haven't made it. You know, my, my ultimate goal is when somebody speak on track and field, I want my name to be brought up in that conversation. 
period. That's not my goal. That's my goal. It wasn't to be head coach. It wasn't this, it wasn't that. It was to get my name out here in the track and field world and, and make it, you know? I got, I, I want to make it. I got, I look at the coach Holloways and all these other coaches and they role models and nobody does, you don't speak on track and field without mentioning coach Holloway's name. I want to be that guy, <laughs> you know? I want to be a coach Johnson, you know? What you're talking about there is two things. One is making a difference, making a change. You know, you're affecting change. Coach Holloway, Coach Johnson, Amy Deem, Bev Kearney's, they've all made positive changes. Uh, and with that, that's how they created that legacy. That, that's what you're defining as legacy. You don't Absolutely. talk about track without mentioning uh, the mouse, the, uh, the DA, the Daryl Anderson, uh, honestly, the Carl Sheffields, to be real frank. You, you just don't. Coach Green. Those. Yeah. Oh, God, of course, Lonnie. Yeah, absolutely. Flo. I mean, just it goes on and on and on. And we're just talking about in the Division One world. Uh, there's plenty of coaches. Al Carius is in Division Three. Oh, yeah. um, uh, Harry Kitchener's in Juco. I mean, they're just they're synonymous because of the legacy, because of the positive effect, the positive change that they've absolutely. made. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's awesome. I like that. Um, and so now Illinois State, uh, and you've done, I, I read on your Facebook, so you, you just had a birthday last month. That's when you turned your, you say you're old now, 34. Everybody who's gray old, hair all up in here. Oh, you know. get out of here. Get, get out of here. I read the tweezers and like, like plucking them. 34. What was I doing at 34? I was barely starting my career at Gill. I was on my third career, buddy. Let me tell you, oh, you're, man. you barely at the starting line. Let me give you that. You're okay. just getting started, man. You're just getting started. Um, <laughs> you got me off track now. <laughs> uh, you've made some decisions. You're now going back to Oklahoma. I am. As some decisions that are best for you and your family and for your, your legacy, for what you're going to accomplish as you uh, roll through coaching. So you're, you're, you're leaving me. You're, you're right here in my, my neck of the woods, and now you're going yeah. back to Oklahoma. Will you start back up your – and maybe it never stopped – the fly time – I don't want to call it a track club, flight time, speed, and enhancement. Yeah, well, um, yeah, never. It was stopped because NCAA rules. Mm, I can't. Okay. I couldn't run the business while I was gone. Got it. Okay. But I'm proud that the athletes who ran under fly time, they still run under fly time. They still call themselves fly time. You know, my, my cousin's a high school coach out there, and that same meet that we hosted at OU, they still run that. And I look at the results, and I see a, a entry under there as fly time or something like that. And I'm like, okay, that's that's kind of cool. That's, that's legacy. That's the goal that I want. I want legacy. I want legacy for me so that I can pass down to my kids who can pass down to their kids. And, yes, and, I'm you know, when I look at the – when COVID-19 hit, when I seen on Facebook, it was like Central Michigan program shut down. Um, Akron program shut down and I'm looking at this like track and field is the first program that are being shut down right now due to COVID. One, I'm 34. We don't get paid that much money. I get paid a fairly decent amount at Illinois State. And I'm blessed when I hear about how, how much other coaches get paid. It's a blessing. But at the same time, I feel like I'm just hanging from a string. You know, and at any time, this string can just snap. And then what can I do at 34? Me and my girlfriend, we've been together for three years. But we're, we're not married and, and bringing in income and things like that. We're still trying to establish a family for ourselves and a lifestyle so we can pass down and have a legacy. Mm. And I look at that and I'm like, well, if I can get into teaching, that's already my coaching salary <laughs> alone. Mm -hmm. um, then if you put in... If I was to be a high school coach again, you know, at this time, I feel like because of Illinois State and my, my history, I'm prepared to be a head coach now. Mm -hmm. So if I can come back to be a, a, maybe a high school head coach, that's more money on top of the fly time. So now I can put in some money in the bank for my family, you know, um, have that rainy day income like we were talking about where I can just, hey, if, the, if, the, if you get a flat tire or, you know, your heater core bust or something like that, you can just go get five, six hundred dollars and just fix it, but not have to worry about paying the light bill or other things later on down the line. Um, and so I was just thinking of that and just my happiness, just, you know, I want to come to work every day and be happy. I want to be excited. I want to be proud. I don't want to, um, you know, be stressing about anything that can happen from collegiate athletics. You know, it's very stressful. I love it to death. I, I love it with a passion. I'm definitely, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it, but I'm, 
not going to miss it because I'm still coaching. I'm still coaching. Yeah, that's still. a good point. Yeah. That's a good you know point. what I mean? Like, I'm going to miss, yeah. I'm gonna miss the, the, the statue of saying I'm a Division One coach. Mm. Well, I will miss that. But I'm still a coach. I'm still helping kids. I'm still changing lives. Absolutely. That's, the, that's, that's why I stayed at high school for so long. I was helping kids go to college, recruiting, mm. going to college. And now I got them in college. And I help them stay in college, but then with the NCAA rules, we are we got limits when what we can do with grades. I didn't know that until I got to Oklahoma State. I remember if I was late to class in JUCO, coach would come right and put you out the classroom. What, what are you doing? Get your head up. Where's your pencil? Where's your notebook? Now I got let me talk to the target. Let me talk to the advisor. What did your teacher say? No, I just want to go in the classroom and get your butt up <laughs> and put you to the front of the classroom and sit there and pay attention. But it's it's not like that, man. I'm I'm a little old school. I remember when I was contemplating moving from junior college back to, to NCAA and I, I spoke to a coach who really changed my, changed the trajectory of my life. And uh, I'll share the, the story with names one day later, maybe in another interview. But uh, I asked the coach, I was like, hey, you know, I recruited the best kids I've ever recruited. I mean, I have an amazing team coming into the, to the junior college I was at. Uh, however, I have another school, the head coach saying that she would hire me. And uh, what, what should I do? You know, if my whole goal is to get to this SEC, what should I do? And he tells me, uh, th these words change my life, literally. He says, Mike, if you want to get to the SEC, he goes, it's probably a good idea to get away from the junior college rule book and get back under the NCAA rule book. <laughs> I remember it was just this vision of, you know, I don't even know if there is a rule book in junior college, <laughs> but there certainly is one for NCAA. Like, maybe a notebook. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe a couple, yeah, it's a post-it note. That's what the, <laughs> and I remember, Rodney, it affected me so much because I respected this guy and still do to this day. I, 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 I was, it was back in the day, we didn't have cell phones. I had the regular phone. I got done, I said goodbye, I clicked the receiver, let it go, dialed up the head coach, uh, it was Sue Parks at Ball State, and said, and said, all right, I'll take the job, I'll be there Labor Day weekend. Like, I, it, it made up my mind that quick. like that, uh, for that, you know, the difference between junior college and NCAAs right. and the rules and what you can do. And by the way, you know, my last year coaching college track was 05. That's 15 seasons ago. The rules have just gotten... I don't want to say worse. They've just gotten maddening. They're just, it's so much more yeah. uh, what, what you have to do as a, as a college coach. I love the route that you're taking, uh, honestly, back uh, to high school coaching. I do think that, um, you know, health for a family and things like that in your own personal life, and I'm not just speaking just directly to you, Rodney, but people in general, uh, you know, you can affect a lot of change there. And, and it's not a if or thing, right? Like as a college coach, you're affecting a lot of change. You're helping kids come to college, especially a lot of kids that are first time they've ever gone to college. So you're, you're, you're a big part of helping them uh, get to the actual college component. As a high school coach, you're mentoring those kids to maybe even dream that they can go to college, whether, whether it's for athletics or not. That doesn't really matter to be real yeah. frank right yeah uh, so I love the the change that you're going to be able to make sure. my, my girlfriend asked me today when we were we were actually walking the track getting some last things out and she's like you gonna miss it and I look and I was like I mean yeah I'm gonna miss the great facilities and you know things like that um but like high school it's like you develop some memories and times that are like I felt like are unwarranted as a college coach you know mm. I remember giving the athletes, you know, their first birthday parties or struggling, um, you know, not coming from silver spoons. And I remember like taking air conditioners to some of the athletes house to help them out or giving them food. Or I remember we had an emergency uh, drawer in my office where we I had like, you know, if we had a, a fundraiser, I put a couple hundred dollars in there that we can help out somebody if they needed some spikes or if they needed a bill or their parents, like those, those memories, I miss those. I miss the little corny little high school chants and coach come put this ribbon on your hat. I, like you miss those little corny things like that, but you are changing their lives. I was asked to be a tennis coach. I got asked to be a golf coach. I'm like, I never coached these sports before, but I, but I know in track and field, they get a lot of football coaches or basketball coaches who coach high school track but they really don't know anything about it or had that passion for it. And so those high school kids, a lot of times their dreams kind of get overshadowed a little bit because they turned off from the bad. 
Yeah, I think that type of um, the, the age group that you're working with, with the high schoolers, I think they need it more, you know, to be real frank. And, and not to say that when a, an 18 to 22 year old when they're in their college don't need it, because I think they need it as well. Uh, it's just when you're dealing with, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, seniors uh, in that age bracket and all the things that they're, they're changing and going through, I think having, uh, you know, leaders, I think having leaders that look like them and have been through what they've been through, I think that's just, I think that's impactful yeah. 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. I really do, man. I just think yeah. that's they're like a such a good... they're ready to soak it up. The college yeah. kids are like, I'm grown. <laughs> well, I think I'm grown. <laughs> well, I think you're right there. The the sponge analogy, and un, and fortunately and unfortunately, that's a good and bad thing, right? Because that they're also a sponge for for negative influences and negative thoughts and negative uh, attitudes. So I think having someone, you know, what Ronnie, you know, what drew me to you what, always you know kept kind of you in my head as far as when we met and through Facebook and through different track meets is your smile and positivity like that's always I don't know that I've ever seen you down like when you've described to me when an athlete didn't live up to the expectation or they didn't win that you thought they'd win or whatever even that is with a smile <laughs> I'm glad yeah. you say that because I want to be one of those guys oh I want to be one of those guys I want people to be like like I always see him happy yeah, yeah, that that's it, man. Uh, and that's really a, do. that's a gift. Uh, that that is a I appreciate that gift. Yeah. And I think that is the type of thing. You know, we all need more. There's a 43 year old man. I need more. Of that. I need more people to be positive around me to help me when I'm not doing great. I, I saw a really cool. I can't remember who posted it, but it was it was like a reminder. It's like, hey, you know, positive people they get depressed. Um, they, they, sometimes. Um, uh, happy people, they sometimes get sad. Like, you know, they're, we, we, you know, you're human still. So we know you have emotions. And so you have to surround yourself with your girlfriend and your kids uh, and uh, coaches and, and your friends. They have to be positive around you so that when you are down, to pick you back up. Just like when one of them are down, now you're the guy who's helping pick them up. And like I said, I just, yeah. just, just don't think you can overstate the importance of that to 14 and 18 year old kids. Um, and any time, you know, I, I'm not a big fan fan of saying, well, the kids today need it more. You know, kids back in the 60s needed that too, man. I, you know, I just think that's so important, man. So I'm super you know, excited. Uh, Coach Gillespie said that quote to me. He, when, I, when I got the job here at Illinois State, he said, you're going to do well. He said, a fond heart will always find a fond heart. And as long as you keep that, you're going to be successful. And then Lonnie, Coach Green called and said, you, hey, Ronnie, you keep them babies, you, you put them babies first, and you keep your head down, and, and you're going to be successful. You go there, and you take care of them kids, Randy, and you keep shining your heart. And the Lord gonna bless you, Randy. He gonna bless you. I'm gonna be praying for you. And I was like, I appreciate it, Coach. And I was like, hey, Coach Green said I can do a good job, baby. <laughs> you know. Hey. But it's true though, and that's what I love about Coach Green is his heart. He's oh. successful because of his heart, not the X's and O's. It's his heart. That's what I respect. I yeah, I got to know Lonnie a lot more when he got to Purdue and now continuing at Kentucky, I knew him when he was in Arkansas. I used to coach at Mississippi state. So I'd see yep. him and everything. Yep. And didn't I, and now at the Gill side, I didn't, I didn't do much business with him when he was in Arkansas, but I always loved talking to him because you just do. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. That was always, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm blessed. That's all goes, I'm blessed. 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 <laughs> and you know, there's some people that say that and it's like, mm, I can see you, man. You may, you don't feel that. Like you, you, you're hurting right now. Right. Him, it was always like, how's this dude always blessed? I feel yeah. it. Like when he says, hey. like, I, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you can tell in his walk, like, <laughs> yes. you got that walk around the track. Yes. Like, yeah, you see me, I'm blessed and I'm yeah. loving it. And consistency. I mean, I've known him now for 20 something years and yeah. it's the same positive love heart message. And that's, that's really just what I, I wish for you, man. You, you're, yeah. you're starting it now. Again, you think you're old, get the F out of here. You ain't old. <laughs> You've got years. I think it, I just know that if you continue that heart posture, uh, that positivity, man, you know, that's the legacy you'll build. That's the legacy Lonnie's building. Uh, I think that's the legacy you'll build. Uh, and maybe I appreciate it. Those are the, like I said, those are the guys I want to, I want to, you know, emulate. I, well, that's some pretty stinking good uh, guys to emulate, my friend. Let me tell you. At the bar. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. 
Well, Rodney, as we wrap up here, uh, so I did something a little different. Uh, I posted on my favorite thing in the whole world, social media, and said, hey, I'm going to have Rodney uh, interview him here in the next week or so. What questions might you have for them? Uh, and my favorite thing in the whole world, uh, I, I guess a mutual friend, I guess you must know him, Adam Pennington came out. He wanted to know, and maybe you can give us some secrets. Lord knows I could use some of these secrets. He wants to know your workout plan because you just look jacked all the time. You've got <laughs> the muscles, man. Uh, and coming from Adam, that's a big. Uh, I know a big, he's, he's bigger than me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty big compliment. Yeah. Have you is is your own health uh, working out and staying in shape? Has that always been something important to you? Yeah, yeah. It always have. It always have. And I mean, like I said, it, it led me into. I knew I wanted to study the body in college. And like I said, mm. I got out of physical therapy. I was like, whoa, that's too much school for me. But you know, I started personal training. Um, I had I started my own classes at Lifetime Fitness and Equinox and things like that. So I always was always in the gym. Um, actually, with Corona hitting, I've been doing a lot of home workouts. Now I actually started like doing um, home workouts with friends, and yeah. we get in there at nine o'clock in the morning. It's probably like twelve of us, and we're doing push-ups and circuits and bands and using, you know, sweet potato cans and green bean cans and corn cans and working out at home. So. You know, hopefully I can look like Adam one day. Adam got that five by five method where he just go in there and put as much weight as he can in five by five and just rock it out. <laughs> yeah, I got the five by five method. It's five excuses, five days a week, baby. Uh, <laughs> I got every excuse in the world why I don't work out anymore, man. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. I've gotten at the here's how old I am, Rodney. I'm now at the age, you know, you get to a certain age where your goal is just can I can I take a walk every day? Can I just walk? Oh man, that's where I'm at, man. That's where I'm at. You gotta get you in the pool, on a bike, you know, the open gym basketball here and there, intramural basketball. See, now, what we're learning, folks, is how well Rodney and I don't know each other. <laughs> I can't swim, Rodney. I can't get in a pool. Get out of here. Uh, a bike, dude. Sometimes we bike as a family instead of walking. And there you go. I don't know what's wrong, man. My quads die. I'm dying. My quads on fire. Two minutes into the bike ride, my kids are just pedaling like little monsters. I don't know how. And they your it. butt sore now too. Now. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't gonna bring that up, Rodney. But okay, fine. Yes, yes, that <laughs> hey, too. That too. Yeah, right we like, we're not kids no more. We used to just ride around the blocks all day, like it was like nothing. No, it, it it gets you. It does. That's why man. we just get on our fishing boats and we just go catch some crappies, some bluegills, and some bass, and catfish. We'd be all right, man. You know, I grew up in Alabama, so you'd think I grew up fishing. Actually, I didn't. Uh, really? But yeah, I went fishing one time with my my brother that I was, I was talking about earlier from the, when we were going to be huge in high school. Him, we went fishing. My, 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 uh, I lived with my grandparents. My grandpa actually ran the marina at the, the Lake You Fall. It's actually a pretty famous lake, you know, big bass and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so they'd have red man tournaments in all the time. It was a big deal. Yeah. And so me and my brother decided one time we'd finally go fishing. Like, okay, let's go see what every, you know, everybody else in Alabama fished. Fished and hunt. I didn't do any of that. So we went, we tried fishing. I think we lasted about 15 minutes before we ended up doing like Star Wars lightsaber duel. It was over. <laughs> we and we never went fishing again. And so I didn't fish for my whole life until I had my son. Uh, yeah, I've got a nine and a six-year-old boy and girl. And my son about four years ago was like, well, I want to fish. And I was like, I guess we go fish. And so yeah, we started, I, I had to learn, I'm 40 years old trying to figure out, you know, all the different things. And now we've got a pond uh, a little ways down from the house. That dude fishes literally every day. Really? He goes, yeah, he loves it. That's why when, when you post on Facebook, where are you going? I was like, well, hey, let me know. Cause uh, my kid will go. We just love to go, man. So and you, yeah, you catch yeah. them big. Now I've seen the, you, you get the, not only the size of the fish, but you catch a whole mess of them too. You have that. Uh, yeah, we uh, have about 65 bluegills. Yeah, 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 it's huge. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's crazy. My little one, she caught 14. Since she caught 14 of them that day. Wow. Yeah, she was, she was on fire. That So it, it's always fun when you catch them, you know, when it you is. cast. And you, yeah. you know, a couple reels and you got a bite, but when you just wait and then you just bake it in the heat, that's, that's. Yeah. Cool. And that's why I just stay at the house. <laughs> <laughs> Rodney, my man, I am so thankful you joined me today. Oh yeah, uh, man, this was I, a pleasure. I feel like I made like the Jay Leno or Jimmy Kimmel show <laughs> or something like that. Like you had all these great guests on. Now I'm like, just sit on the sit next to them. Man, I'm a part of the, the celebrity club now. <laughs> here's, the, here's the secret, man. 
I do this, you know, we, we do this at Gill. We called it Connections for a reason, you know, to bring people together so that people who've never met you, maybe through listening to the podcast, will get to know you a little bit better. And maybe that's the person that'll reach out to you for your next opportunity for you and your family and things like that and vice versa. You'll hear people, uh, maybe, maybe you listen to Brooks Johnson or uh, Judd Logan and we're like, man, Th that inspired me. I want to have the same legacy like those two gentlemen specifically, right? Uh, but I'll give you a little secret. I get so much out of this. It's unbelievable. Like I literally, sometimes I look at my bosses and I'm like, so you're letting me do this? You're paying me to start sure. this podcast? Oh my, God. like I I'm the one getting over, man. I'm learning so much. I get to have such a great time. I get to know my friends even better and i get to meet new people i got to talk i got to interview brooks johnson man come on yeah, yeah. get out of here i got to interview charles ryan diego who i've known forever uh, dude that's awesome so you don't miss the, the the collegiate track and field coaching part that you doing all this really zero, zero. here's what i miss and it and it's not specifically collegiate right you know, I had a lot of success. I had SEC champ in the yeah. long jump, three flat in the four by four, things like that, right? And those are great. I, I miss the people. There are just some amazing people from athletes to coaches, you know, the coaching staff we had at Mississippi State. Um, they're, they're still like brothers to me. You know, I've interviewed Houston Franks here, you know, early in the season, uh, who's my roommate, uh, you know, Steve Dudley, Al Schmidt, Keith, uh, Angela, uh, Kay Ray. I mean, we just had a blast, just common goal, working together and making 18 to 22 year olds better. And then when you throw the athletes on top of it, you know, I yeah. had so many, you know, from the kids I had at Ball State, the kids at JUCO that I had, the kids at Mississippi State. Uh, it, it's a little bit like what you said. I love like, and thank God for Facebook. I know Facebook gets a bad rap and certainly they're not perfect. Like any of us. But man, I love when a kid that I used to coach and they're showing pictures of their wife and their kids yeah. and they're showing, I mean, yeah. that just, like, come on, man. I had a, it's a small part, but I had a small part in that. Uh, what I don't miss and what I love is when I talk to a track coach and they tell me about, oh man, I had to do all this paperwork and this and that. And I'm like, mm, good. Yeah. See, I got out. <laughs> that coach should like go be English and journalism majors, all the paperwork we got to do. The business majors. Like. Here's the thing. I always have kind of a little bit, it's a, it's a joke. Cause I, you know, I respect and love the profession of coaching, specifically coaching track and field. It's such, it's my whole life. I mean, it's literally my whole life. Right. Uh, I always joke, especially with a young coach, they'll say something like, Oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go into coaching or whatever. And I'll always say, so what was your major? And they'll say, you know, everything from biomechanics to journalism or whatever. And I'm like, you look smarter than that. Why would you get into coaching? <laughs> like you could go cure cancer. Like I, I believe in of all the coaches I have met throughout this country. And trust me, I've met a ton. I, you know, there's a few, co uh, my goal is kind of like Pokemon, catch them all, right? I want to, I want to know every coach out there. Uh, I'm, I'm starting with the college level. One day I'll get to the whole level, right? But uh, you know, there's so many great, great people, uh, smart people, motivational people, oh, yeah. intelligent people, personable people. And I'm like, man, that person could have done X. That person could have oh, done yeah. Y. That person could have done Z. And you're sitting here making a kid jump in sand. That's what you chose for your, <laughs> for your career. Now, the good thing is there's a lot of positives for that too. But man, you know, the power, the, the positive power, positive impact that a coach, specifically a track and field coach can make is it's really speechless. Uh, I've seen it too many times. I've seen too many kids who have the story of, you know what, I didn't think I was worth anything until that coach looked me in the eye and said, you can be good. You can be good Absolutely. at this event. Absolutely. You can be good at that. They believed in me. And that is the real power is the, the authentic belief someone has in other people. And to me, that is the majority of why good human beings become coaches is they want to affect positive change that's where they get their ego struck. And that's, that's awesome because they affect, they, they generate generationally change people's lives and families. And it can't be stated enough, man. I can never lift up the power of people who choose to be coaches, specifically track coaches. I can never lift them up enough, man. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, yeah. That's what we do. You're awesome, man. Uh, I'm so sad that you're, you're leaving my area, but here's the good news is our paths are going to cross my friend. Always, 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 always. Awesome, man. Right. Well, thanks, thanks for joining us today, man. I had an absolute blast. For sure, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Absolutely.